It is my great pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Dan Meyer. Dan Meyer is, or was, a high school math teacher. He is currently, however, out of the classroom. He's at, uh, going through a doctoral, he is a doctoral candidate, I should say, at Stanford University um, in the field of math education. However, while he was in the classroom, he inspired his students, and not only his students, but through his sharing of information, through his blogs, through his workshops, he inspired a multitude of teachers and other students through his innovative teaching strategies, one of which is the three-act math tasks, where he helped to take and make math real to all students. He made it understandable by taking what happens in everyday life and seeing the math behind it. I am sure he could do a wonderful activity with the chairs in this room even and trying to figure out how can you get how many people in here. But what he does is he opens up and he challenges his students, asks questions, and makes them come up with the answers. So hopefully you will enjoy what he has to share with us. And please help me in bringing up Mr. Dan Meyer. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Dan. It's nice to be here. What's your name? I'm always so hopeful that works. So over the course of this talk, there will be a few pretty personal disclosures on my part. It would help me a lot to know who you were a little bit. So my name is Dan. It's nice to meet you. What's your name? Some of you still aren't playing along. That's, that's fine. I think that uh, next week when I'm making out the invitation list for my birthday party, you may regret your decision here today, friends. So this is my first cue. This is also my, um, my grandparents are here from Minnesota, age 85, their first cue. How about that? Grandma says to me this morning, Grandma says, it's, you're never too old to jump on the cue train, Dan, and, and wiser words were never spoken. Um, so here's the first personal disclosure is that at this moment in time, I'm really in, in love with ed tech. I'm in love with ed. I'm in love with tech. Um, I, I love what it does for my kids, uh, what it has done for my kids. The other part, though, is that ed tech at one point in my life made me feel really tense. I felt tense at conferences just like this. And I want to share with you how I worked my way out of that in case it's helpful for you also. Um, that tension... Uh, it, it, it's a rope being pulled between two different sides there. And on one side, what you have are my finite resources as an educator. You guys know what those are, right? Time, money, patience. I mean, some of those are less finite than others. Money, uh, for some of us, is less finite if your district is, is well-heeled or well-to-do. But all of us have finite time. All of us have 180 hours with these kids. And that, that's tense for me, because on the other side of that rope, uh, me and my, my boy Tyler were checking out uh, the Sketch app last night. You've seen that up there on the screen? You just like, you scroll that thing and it just goes for days and days. It's basically infinite here at Q. And that can feel really tense for me. Like I'm in your session, whatever your session is. Let's just pick it out of the hat. Let's say uh, flipping your classroom with Minecraft and Google Apps for Educators, just to pick a, a random one. And like I'm getting all inspired and into it, and then all of a sudden it occurs to me, like I'm, I'm losing time, cash, and patience here. It's hard. I want to talk with you briefly about how I work my way out of that, how I deal with the infinite here at Q. Um, but first, it would help me so much if you would let me kind of exercise my demons of my past of being frustrated at conferences like this and, and give you briefly what I would call the ed tech presentation for people who don't like ed tech presentations. This is like a, this is like a summary of like every ed tech talk I've, I've, I've sat in and just felt really frustrated by. It would help me if you'd let me go through this really fast and then we'll push this aside and then on to the optimism. Is that okay? Just briefly here. It'll be fast. The deal is, is they often start out, they often start out with kind of the, the old timey photo of rows and desks, basically saying this is my classroom right here without Minecraft in it, that sort of thing. Maybe true, maybe not. Then we move on and we've got like a, 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 a little kids, sad kids, 
hold on these signs, you know, written by adults. And I just, I feel bad. Like, I just want to give this kid Minecraft, you know? Like, Minecraft will make him happy. You know, then we move on. We got uh, charts are always in these talks, really uh, authoritative looking charts. Got some statistics. It's important to have stats to back up your argument, of course. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You guys know that's true, right? Uh, yeah, did you know? And then uh, you, you want to really be careful not to look in the bibliography or the sources list for some of these talks too much. Sketchy stuff there. You got China showing up, or Finland, or Korea, or I guess it's Russia now. We're back to Russia being kind of our educational Bond villain of the day. That shows up. And throughout it all, throughout all these talks that I've been to and felt tense in, there's this, this tone, this sense that, hey, hey, the times, they are a changing. You, you, you've got to change with them. Like, how do you change? You pick up a tool. You pick up some kind of app, website, hardware, software, it doesn't matter, man. You got to change because the times they are uh, doing that too. But here's the thing is that these tools right here, I'm from the Silicon Valley, so I'm, I'm from the, the, the epicenter of where a lot of this stuff happens. And I know that so many of these tools were created on a case of Red Bull and three hours of sleep a night. <laughs> You know, and we've been through this as educators. If you've been in this job for, for more than a few years, like, you know what happens to a lot of these tools right here. Like, they, they disappear. They change pay models. They go out of business. They start throwing ads in front of your kids. This all happens. And my, my struggle here is this, is that if, if my highest ed tech mission statement, I use those terms advisedly here, ed tech mission statement was, hey, you got to pick something up. The times they are changing. When the tool goes away, I feel kind of dazed, and I just stumble around to the next tool. If my highest ed tech mission statement isn't stronger than that, I wind up feeling tense. So this is the story of my ed tech mission statement, what guides me towards some tools and away from others. And I can't recommend enough that you have an ed tech mission statement too. And if you don't have one for now, feel free to borrow mine, but get your own here. Here's mine right here. My ed tech mission statement is this. And this is why I am so exhilarated at Q as opposed to tense and aggravated is that I know what I'm looking for. These are the tools I am looking for right here. They do one of three things, hopefully more than one. They are, I want tools that help me capture perplexity, that help me share perplexity, and that help me resolve perplexity. That's it. I need that. It's the hardest thing I do as an educator. I need tools that help me do it. What is perplexity? This thing I'm after. Let me tell you, perplexity, what it's not is, it's not boredom. Boredom is when a kid doesn't know something and doesn't want to know that thing. Basically is boredom, truth. And then it's also not uh, confusion. Confusion's when a kid doesn't know something, wants to know that thing, but doesn't believe that knowing that thing is within her power it results in this confused sense. Perplexity comes along once in a while. What is it? It's when a kid doesn't know something, wants to know that thing, and believes that knowing that thing is within her power. That right there is some of the most powerful learning moments I've ever seen. So powerful, it's really hard for me as a teacher to mess those up when all three things are true. I'm after tools that help me do that. They're not easy to find here. So check it out. Uh, perplexity is also not engagement. I want to clarify that. As a math educator, I have, when I pursue engagement as my highest ed tech mission statement, I do some, pretty, um, some things that embarrass me in my discipline. For instance, like a, a word problems. Kids, they hate word problems. But if I chase engagement, I tell myself, I convince myself that these kids will, will love this word problem. They'll be engaged by this word problem, provided that I insert their names into the problem itself. I've done this and convinced myself my kid love this. Or my kids love this right here, but it's just not true. Chasing engagement for me has got me in trouble. I chase perplexity instead, this sense of having a question, knowing it can be answered and wanting to get it answered. That's what I'm after here. So, not engagement. It's also not this right here. This right here is engagement. This is a, out of a, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. This is a, a poster they put out. This is trying to engage kids in the study of parabolas, right? Engage them. I want to contrast this right here with this image right here, which attempts to capture perplexity and share it with a student. Do you see the difference? This right here, I think, I love bridges. I love bridges. Maybe I'll learn parabolas. This right here, I wonder, will the ball go in? And that requires me to learn parabolas to find out. That's what I'm after here. Can you help me? Um, others. I don't know. Like, I can tell you, the only country in the world that starts with O, 
is Oman. And that might be an engaging factoid for you, some trivia, but how much better would that have been if I made it perplexing by doing what? Just asking you, what's the only country in the world that starts with O? And now you're thinking about it, racking your brain, maybe Googling. That's a perplexing experience versus an engaging experience. That's what I'm after here. So what I'm bringing to the table is this right here. This website has some stuff on it. Mainly what it has is this. I'll have this up at the end also, so don't sweat writing it down right now. But what it has on it is a bunch of tools that do these three things for me, and also some videos that explain how to use them, like my voice over it, talking over a screencast. It's got uh, assignments for you. So for instance, it's got a, a beginner level assignment if you've never used this tool to create perplexity. Then a pro level assignment if you want to go a little farther with your skills. And then a screencast where I'll explain all this stuff. It would be a terrible use of our time here, our precious time, uh, for me to, to spend this room's time on a how-to session. I want to spend our time on a why-to session. Like, why should you bother with tool X versus tool Y, given your finite time, cash, and patience? That's the point here. So without further ado, can I share with you the, the tools that help me capture perplexity? I'm starting with the two most important, just in case I fall down dead here, I'll have those out of the way. The most important by far for me is the internet, which is like a uh, no duh, right? But here's the deal. Like the internet is, is kind of this large, wild game preserve goes on forever. What you need to find the perplexity is some kind of a, a Sherpa, some kind of a, a bush guide or something to help you go through the wild there. And for me, that's called an RSS reader. I'm always curious. A room as tech savvy as this, who here has an RSS reader? Show of hands? Interesting. I, so here's the thing. I'm really curious like, if these are going away or what, but for me, it's the most important thing for me. What this does for me is back in the day, I would have, uh, let's see, can we uh, get that fire back up there? Can someone press play in the back? Back in the day, I would have 50 tabs lined up along a browser. I'd open them all up, open them all up, and I'd uh, go through each one and say, oh, nothing new there, nothing new there, still nothing. I'd close it. It would take me tons of time to go through all those tabs right there. But what happens with an RSS reader is I throw all of those tabs into one website, and then they send the updates to me. They ping me whenever anything new shows up. And what that results in is I can check out loads of new stuff very quickly. So I go to this website, um, an RSS reader, and I just go through and I press the J key, the J key, the J key, the J key, all the way through. I'm looking at it and I'm like, ah, uh, nothing too perplexing there, I move on. Nothing too perplexing there, I move on. And then finally, finally I see it. I see perplexity in the wild. It's this right here. For a certain kind of student at a certain kind of time, this right here will be very perplexing. This is a graph of water usage in the 2010 gold medal hockey game, which featured, I believe, uh, Canada and the US. Big game right here. This is the water consumption in Edmonton right here on the day of the game. That blue line there, the one that's going nuts, that's the day of the game. The green line behind it, it's more steady, that's the day before the game. And the perplexing question that I have right now is why? Like, why does hockey affect water consumption? Can you tell your neighbor why that graph, that blue one, is freaking out for us? Tell them why. Isn't that bizarre? What a bizarre graph. What are the peaks about? There's also valleys. What are the valleys about? What's going on here? What do you got here? Why the peaks? Who's got a loud voice somewhere in the middle here? Why the peaks? What's going on when the water peaks there? Talk to us real loud. Bathroom breaks. Why would the, so there's a, why would why would the, the bathroom breaks happen like in, in a hockey game? Like how are the two connected? Bathroom breaks. Like why are there? There's four. There's four 
spikes there. And some of you guys feel really confident here. You're yelling out like there's periods or whatever. And I want to kind of perplex you further here. That's how I see my job as a teacher nowadays. As much as trying to explain stuff is to try to perplex you. So some of my students here, my students are saying, oh, it's the periods and folks go to the bathroom on the periods. So what do I say to them is this is, well, I know there's three periods in hockey and I count four spikes. Okay, now they're still going at it here. They still, uh, it's just like that. This is the kind of crowd I'm working with here. Real know-it-all type students. Okay, hold on, hold on. Here's the deal is that last spike, I'm trying to perplex them further here. It's not easy, but it's so fun to try. That last spike right there is not overtime. It has nothing to do with overtime. Middle ceremony is always someone nice there, nice. So check it out. Let's just, uh, that's great. Let's dispel the mystery here. What we got here is this. Is yeah, end of the first, second, and third period there. Where the, it's not a commercial break. If it was a commercial break, we'd have like maybe smaller and more spikes perhaps. And then on the bottom there, uh, we've got face off as a little itty bitty one. We got Canada wins. And then I love that little brief thing like this right here, that local maximum right there where a few people scurry to the bathroom real fast. And then we got that medal ceremony at when, when we're at our lowest point of water consumption, after which, after which we're finally done and everyone runs off to the bathroom there. That's an amazing graph right there, an amazing graph. And we have had a perplexing moment, you and me talking about this. So here's the thing I'm worried about though is I've, I've found perplexity on this website in my RSS reader, but I haven't captured it. I'm in a really dangerous spot right here where I, you, know, you and I know how many great ideas we've forgotten over the years. This room collectively has forgotten more great ideas for teaching kids because it's so hard to hold it all. So the other tool I use right now really fast um, is a social bookmarking tool. And what we do here is like, uh, there's other things out there that you can throw into your RSS reader first. Like this is a website I just found totally devoted to the same thing, which is finding grammar mistakes, specifically a certain kind. What's the error here? What do you see? Apostrophe. This nails on the chalkboard for some of you. Right here, you see it again, right? Drives some of you ELA folks nuts. Uh, right here, again, like, this one kills me. I have so many perplexing questions about this. Like, if, it, if it's not free, then what is it? You know, how much does it cost? And who's this Santa character, you know? Uh, some, some felon with a white beard? I don't know, I'm scared. Anyway, you throw this in your RSS reader and lo and behold, the stuff comes to you on the regular um, instead of you going to it. And then what I got to do now, though, is send this and bookmark it somewhere permanent. So what I do is I say, hey, go to my social bookmarking tool and, and it automatically loads up the title and that URL. And then what I do, all I have to do, my only job here is to try to predict what future Dan will remember about that graph of water consumption, which is easier said than done. So I go through this thing here, I start looking, I tag it with say infographics, which is what it is. I tag it with hockey would be an obvious one. Statistics, of course. I can uh, throw down perplexity and see everything I've ever tagged with perplexity in it. I can put down my district's acronym and then all of us in the district can be tagging things uh, together and spread that load of finding different perplexing things across all of us. Um, potty would make a lot of sense to me here. In in general, I, I got all those tags on there. I add myself a little description of what it was and how I might use it. And then I hit save and that's when, guys, I throw myself a little party. That's when it's, it's there for good and I never forget stuff. RSS reader, social bookmarking is, this, is my ed, part of my ed tech mission statement. I haven't included what the name of the tools I use is. I don't care. Google reader shut down, some of you guys know, is a tragic moment, moment of silence there. Okay, but then like we're back and like we find another tool to get the job done because the mission statement matters, not the tool itself. Here's my delicious page, my bookmarking page right here. It goes on for days and days and days. And what it is, I think to myself, oh, there's that video I wanted to show my kids. It had to do with rates. So I click on the rates tag and it was about football. My football kids would love it. I click the football tag and bam, this thing I would have forgotten 10 years ago now just pops right back up at me. How about Rich and the 40? So here we go again. 
Rich, miles per hour with strides. That's gonna be the first thing you see. Let's check you out. Go. What are we looking at here? What are we topping out? 16.0? All right, here we have Rich versus Julio Jones. Full speed. <laughs> Rich, you gotta stay in the picture. All right, how about with a 10 yard lead? And here comes Julio. <laughs> okay, now versus Julio, half speed. No, not half speed. Get him, Rich, get him. Uh, that right there, like that is a, a perplexing moment where I'm wondering who's gonna win that race. With Julio Jones at half speed, uh, with a little head start, what's gonna happen there? That's what's great about the internet and capturing perplexity and saving it for good there. This is off YouTube though. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to build an entire lesson off of YouTube only to see it crash and burn. Um, that happens one time and never again, am I right? What, what is a, a bad, what, why should we not build a lesson around a YouTube link? Give me reasons here. Filter. So for one, it's like YouTube is inaccessible. There's that one. But what if it is accessible? It is accessible. What else could be a problem here? Like any of you guys try to load, a, a, like all of you have been trying to watch YouTube simultaneously, I'm told, here at Q, because it just shuts the thing down. Yeah, bandwidth is a problem. Related content, sponsored ads, comments, which are uh, illiterate at best. You know, just horrible stuff, right? So for all those reasons, if I want to be a teacher who captures perplexity for my students, I've got to capture stuff off YouTube. The tool itself doesn't matter, but Google, how do I get videos off YouTube? If you're like me and you need that capability. One tool shows up is KeepVid. Again, the tool's not important, the use is important. And all you do is you paste in that link of the YouTube video, hit go, and now I've got all these links. I can get that video off of YouTube onto my computer. It makes me all the more powerful as an educator. I'm capturing perplexity there. Um, this thing starts to get weird right now. I told you about personal disclosures. I feel like I know you though. Um, so here's the deal. This is perhaps the most important but simplest tool I got for capturing perplexity, which is a simple list that lives on the internet where I'm walking around and I notice something perplexing that would, uh, that would perplex my students, I've got to write that thing down. Why is it important to write down our ideas? Not so we use them right now or tomorrow, uh, but so that we get more ideas in the future. This is my theory, and it's kind of a weird one, and I appreciate your patience here, is that I'm walking around at all times with a fairy on my shoulder. I call it the perplexity fairy. You can't see it, don't try it. And what the deal is, is it's always, this fairy is always whispering ideas in my ear. Stuff about that water graph, a consumption graph. Stuff about a, a Julio Jones, whisper, whisper, whisper. Those whispers are the happiest part of my job as an educator. I love that, I cherish them. I want them to keep on coming, to keep whispering. What I have to do to guarantee that happens is to write write, write all the time in this list. This list right here I have running on Google Docs goes for days and days. I have no idea what's even up there right now. I don't come back to it necessarily. That's not the point. It makes me more creative. I get more questions later. You guys have been super cool with this whole fairy idea. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a picture of the fairy here real fast. And you gotta promise we'll still be friends, okay? Here it is. Here's the fairy. And I want to share with you the five things this fairy has whispered to me in recent past here. For instance, here's different things like uh, model solar system in Maine. Where is Earth? Very perplexing to me. Moving on, uh, things like this, fraudulent tennis balls. I really have no idea what that means at this point in my life. But I know that writing that down means I'll have more ideas in the future. Uh, the landlord says we have to have 80% of our floor covered. And I'm wondering things. I'm perplexed and I captured it. Yellow lights, speed up or stop. A question that math can help you answer? I don't know, but I wrote it down. That's all very important to me. Stair machine, take two stairs at a time versus one. I encourage you guys to become more perplexing, perplexed and curious educators. Keep a list of what you see and where you see it. It's been so big for me. I love that this uh, same phone that I have that helps me call, uh, let's me call Graham Graham over here, you know, on, on the regular, it lets me also capture perplexity in, in enormous ways, diverse ways. So for instance, I'm at say a Starbucks. Let's just say this, Starbucks. I'm looking up there and I'm noticing that the Starbucks cup sizes go up in regular amounts. Uh, 12 ounces, 16 ounces, 20 ounces, up by four ounces every time. 
And then I notice the prices aren't so regular. And I'm wondering who's getting ripped off here. But I don't have a pencil or a pen or a piece of paper. I love, like, I can pull that phone out and just leave a voice memo or call Google. And I, I, I say into my phone, linear pricing at Starbucks. I hang up, and then in the mail comes that email with linear pricing at Starbucks. I never forget an idea this way. I want to turn myself from this walking, breathing, living antenna that captures all the perplexing stuff around me. My kids love that. They love it. Uh, other moments, for instance, I love that this same phone is a pretty good camera. That's awesome. Uh, my wife also here kindly knows the experience of me driving around in a rental car somewhere, and she's trying to take a nap in the passenger seat, and all of a sudden, I've slammed the brakes on, and I'm spinning a U right there because I've seen something that I absolutely have to capture because it's perplexing. Does anybody in here, can you tell your neighbor what this is right here? Why is this so perplexing? I had to grab this right here. What is it? Tell me. Lightning rod? Not a lightning rod. It's true. I've already told you what this is. This right here is the model solar system in Maine. Do you know what, what planet this is? Not Earth. The other blue one, you nailed it. Uh, see me afterwards for a prize that I'll make up right now, okay? This right here, yeah, is Neptune. So are you wondering like I am? Uh, that is your prize. That's fine. That is your prize. Um, <laughs> Are you wondering, as I am, like, where is Earth right now? I wonder, where is the sun? Can you even create a sun at that scale? Science folks would probably know. Or is it too big entirely to even create that? This is perplexing. I love, I have tools that help me capture perplexity. Or this right here, that same phone that takes voice memos, that captures photos, also captures video, along with calling Graham Graham. It's amazing to me. So I'm in, I'm in North Carolina one time, and it comes to my attention that there is a campaign to stop short yellow lights going on in North Carolina. <laughs> stop short yellow lights? Like, this has never occurred to me, you know? Like, why would anybody shorten yellow lights? Like, who wins with shorter yellow lights? CHP. <laughs> yeah, like the government does. You get more revenue in run red lights, let's say, or more, more uh, speeding tickets or whatever. Um, so that's great. Like, it's tough economic times. Uh, city governments need, uh, need more cash in the coffers. Let's do it. But who loses when we shorten yellow lights? Pedestrians. <laughs> right. Pedestrians do, definitely. Uh, pedestrians, other drivers, basically everybody loses. So there's this campaign to stop short yellow lights. I'm out there far from home in North Carolina, and I just take my phone out, uh, pulled over to the side of the road, put in park, a, a key out of the ignition, of course, and I start grabbing video of yellow lights around town, and I create this little clip right here. Check it out. You saw it right there? How one seemed a little bit shorter than the others? And so now I'm thinking I got myself a perplexing video in a perplexing class project. We're going to put up a wall map, a wall map of Mountain View, California right here. We're going to divide out all the stop lighted intersections to all my students who all have these tools also. They'll go out and capture a video. They'll grab the speed sign, run the linear correlation, find out which lights are no good, and we'll bring City Hall down. That's your final project right there, kids. After you have tenure, of course. I hope you're in a, a right-to-work area. <laughs> Definitely. So, I mean, I just love the tools, the tools. I'm not in love with the tools for their own sake. I have no loyalty to any particular brand. I need tools that help me capture perplexity. These are them. And I'll tell you, you know you're in trouble. You know you're doing this right when you can't shut it down and you're in some bathroom somewhere and you notice that the urinal has a math problem on it. And the fairy, your, 
your personal fairy, guys, of course, in this instance, your, your personal fairy is whispering to you, hey, check out the math problem there. It says the pint saves 88% more water over a one gallon urinal. And you're like, shut up, just shut up, okay? I gotta just be quiet. But you can't shut that voice up. And that, for me, is the happiest times I've ever had as an educator, seeing a math problem at a urinal. And just, uh, <laughs> let me walk that one back a little bit here. In truth, though, uh, you should be careful pulling out your camera phone at a urinal in a men's bathroom. <laughs> safety first, everybody, safety first. So that right there is, is capturing perplexity, and I spent a load of time on it for one reason only, and that is it is the hardest thing for me to do. Uh, the, the longer I am away from my general education time at UC Davis as a college student, where I was taking courses in uh, Italian-American cinema, psychology, astronomy, whatever, the farther I am from those times, and the more I have been a math teacher, math teacher, math teacher, the harder it is for me to see the world as a perplexing place like my students do. It takes discipline and sadly work for me to make myself as curious as they are. These are the tools that help me do that. If you see me walking around and you relate to that and you have a tool I've missed, please stop me, please share. So once you have perplexity captured, how do you share it? It's pretty basic, guys. It's like, I need, I need for myself, I need a, a, a laptop to store this stuff on. I need a projector to share it with you guys. I need uh, audio and then a document camera. That's all I need. The document camera is the only kind of odd one there. Uh, the document camera lets me share a particular kind of perplexity that others do not. What perplexing kind of thing does a document camera let me share with my students? Like, documents? <laughs> See me afterwards. <laughs> Sassy. It, but it's true, though. No, a certain kind of document, though. I can scan some documents, and I can go online and grab other ones. But the kind of documents I can share with kids is student work. In a math class, if you don't know, student work in math class is often very perplexing and very... <laughs> very worthwhile showing to students. My favorite times have been talking with students about their errors and destigmatizing them and making them a source of conversation. And kids walk away where they could have felt like, oh man, I'm a dummy. And they feel like, oh man, we just spent a half hour talking about my work and what was great about it and what we changed. Those are great times. I need a document camera for that right there. I use stuff like Keynote. All right, this is the basics here. But I don't use it to put uh, notes up there and read off of them. I hope you see that now. I'm I'm trying to sequence up perplexing stuff to start a conversation, you and me. I love video editing tools and photo editing tools. This is all such an enormous help to me. After Effects and Final Cut, all of that right there. But here's the scary part for me. The hard part is that sharing perplexity is as much about pedagogy as it is about technology. It's as much about being a good teacher as it is about you know, knowing where the, the latest tools are, the best apps and all of that. Like this right here, this is how I found that graph on the internet, where the person who shared that with me was trying to engage me. What do you notice about this that's different from how I shared it with you? You see it, right? It's got the punchline up there. So part of sharing, sharing perplexity for me is just covering stuff up with a white rectangle and PowerPoint or Keynote and then blending that into the background like that. We've turned what was engaging into something that's now perplexing, not simple. When I talk about sharing perplexity, uh, like right here, I could also put a black rectangle over that percentage there, very simple, and ask students, if this urinal is telling you the truth about itself, what would that percentage read right there? And students ask me, like, what do you mean a urinal telling the truth? That's very odd. But we work it out. We go through that. Um, I also share perplexity, not just with my students. Uh, but Eileen mentioned that I share perplexity online on a blog. And this could be its own talk in and of itself, but I just want to tell you right now how amazing it is to have a faculty lounge like I do that stretches the entire internet. Go to any session you can on Twitter as PD, blogging as PD. It's been the best part. One of the best parts about me, my, my development as a teacher is I have this, uh, I watched this video. I watched this video called Orbeez. It's a, a kid's toy. Do you know Orbeez? I don't know Orbeez. I saw this video though. What it is is this, is you take a little pellet 
and you dunk it in water and it blows up. Simple, right? Um, but uh, on the evidence of this commercial here, kids absolutely love it. These kids all seem far too hyperactive about this toy to me. But they love it here. Here's the thing, though, is that Orbeez makes a pretty big claim on their website. They claim right here on their website that it grows to 100 times their volume. You saw that there. You saw the commercial. I'm seeing that, and I'm thinking, that does not look like 100 times the volume to me. It looks like less, like much less. So I figure, like, it's perplexing to me. I write it down. I turn it into a lesson. I go to the store, to Toys R Us, and like a total weirdo, I buy Orbeez. And then I dunk them myself. I get this right here. Just nod to your neighbor. Give a thumbs up. That's 100 times or more. Or a thumbs down. That's less than 100 times. Just curious what the room is on this one. Hold them up. Let me see them here. Front row folks are holding theirs sideways. That's not allowed. That's... They missed the prompt right here. Here's the deal. My kids run the math on this thing, and they find out, lo and behold, volume is really hard to estimate. 3D stuff, hard to estimate. It is over 100 times the volume. That's pretty crazy. And so what happens next is, like, I could then say, all right, nice lesson on volume. I'll tuck that one away for next year. But what I do is I go online. I have this blog, and I share it with people. People can download the material. They get my little lesson right up there. And that could be it. Like, my efforts have multiplied because you download my stuff, but better stuff happens. People come along, veteran educators, and they come along and say, hey, that's nice, but what you should have done is this, this, and this. And I hate that at first. It's miserable. But then I start to love it. And eventually, I start claiming to people, in all sincerity, I feel like as a new teacher, I grew two years of growth as a teacher for every one year I was in the classroom. The difference was my online professional development and all the kind veteran educators who came by to critique me and offer suggestions. That number is totally made up, but the feeling is sincere. <laughs> The feeling is totally sincere. I encourage you to get an online output. Even better stuff happens because Sharon Cohen stops by my blog and leaves a comment. Who's Sharon Cohen? Sharon Cohen is the brand manager of Orbeez. And I'm thinking to myself, oh no. I do not need another lawsuit right now. But what's happening is so great. Sharon Cohen comes by, and what she's offering is Orbeez internal data set of different tests that they ran with different kinds of ionic content of water to see which grew the biggest possible Orbeez. So now we've got a science unit where we bring the person in from down the hall to talk about what the heck ionic content means, and a data analysis unit to boot, all because I put my stuff online Where's yours? Share your perplexity with me. My advisor at Stanford says this. Doesn't that ring true? It's, a, it's an unforgiving place to learn to teach, and it's all we've got until Twitter, until online PD like that. You know, like, I think about doctors. Doctors have cadavers, you know? Like, doctors <laughs> make their mistakes on cadavers that don't care. Like, if you're real, like, I don't know, I think back to 03, 04, pre-calculus period three, I would give a pretty sizable pile of cash to go back and have that year as a do-over. Like, I know there's kids in that class who walked away really disliking math. If they'd had me later on, they might have liked it a little bit more. It's a, but it's an unforgiving place to learn to teach right there. Share your stuff online. Get better online first. I love it. Last one here is resolving perplexity. Now you've captured it, this perplexing thing. You shared it with your kids or with each other. Now you got people in your life with this pressure in their head. They want to know an answer. They believe that knowing it is within their power. What do you do to resolve that? This may feel like a bit of a cheat here. I warn you in advance. Check it out. I've shown you this graph. You want to know what's going on. The tool. The web tool, the URL you go to, to resolve that perplexing question is math. It's math. That's the tool. It feels a bit like a cheat. Let me run this by you one more time here. If you want to know who's going to win that foot race, I've captured that video. I've shared it with you. I've posed the question, who's going to win? You've done, uh, to, to resolve that perplexing question, uh, the hardware that you have to buy 
from the vendor booth down the hall is math. It's, it's math is what it is. Like your discipline is the tool to help students resolve perplexity you create, capture, and share. Right here, if you are perplexed by this image, if you want to know how much cash is that on the walls at the Guggenheim at this exhibit, like the tool is I'm gonna teach you how to calculate surface area and find answers in real world problems. That's the software, that's the hardware, that's the URL, that's the app, that's everything right there. It's your discipline. This right here, I have no idea what this is right here. Anti-gravity machine. And look, it's not attracted. It's just weird stuff, eddy current. Here's what I promise you, is that I, if I'm your science student and you capture that off YouTube, you share it with me, I will want to know. I will sit attentively. I will take notes all throughout your lecture of anything having to do with eddy currents. So much the better if you tell me how I can levitate my baby sister with that stuff or rob some bank somewhere. But that's it. That's our disciplines are the technology to help students resolve their perplexity. Like this right here, in science class, this is my, this is my chemistry education right here in high school. Like you don't wanna know how much chemistry I pursued after this kind of education right here. Where the teacher would just go through and lecture their way through different compounds and balancing equations with them and what's their atomic weight. How much different would my interest in potassium chlorate have been if my teacher had showed me this right here first? Turning gummy bears into fireworks? Are you kidding me, man? Are you kidding me? Teach me, what is this potassium chlorate of which you speak? Like, that's it right there, that's everything. Like this right here, I've captured this paragraph, it is perplexing. What kind of technology could you offer a student to help her unperplex herself about what this paragraph is trying to say? Hit me, what do you got? Spacing, grammar in general, spacing in particular, what else? Punctuation, so you can know where thoughts begin and end, all of this. Yes, spacing, punctuation, uh, capitalization tells you when thoughts start or what important words are. This has life and death consequences. <laughs> this is like a different way from how I was taught or how I learned to teach, how I started teaching. Like I told someone earlier today on the Infinite Thinking Machine podcast, like, I got into math teaching because I, I loved math. I needed no incentive to love math. Line up a whole bunch of problems, I'll do it. Attach your approval as my teacher, I'll do it even more here. But then they gave me students who lo and behold don't love math like I do. So whereas before, I, my first year's teaching, I would start with whatever my objective was. I would write it on the board, I'd say it four times in the first 10 minutes or whatever ridiculous thing you have to do. And then I would lecture my way through it. I'd do three examples. I'd have my kids do 20 practice problems, maybe 10 for homework. And the survivors of that process would then get to do some kind of perplexing application of it long after they stopped caring. And I'm just telling you this, I'm not saying like I don't lecture anymore or lecture's bad or never say anything that a kid can say for themselves. I'm not gonna stand up here and say that, like I don't lecture. That's part of my value as a teacher is one who can explain difficult things. But how I treat that lecture now is I flip that around. And now I start with what is perplexing. I show something, I ask for your guess about that Orbeez. Is it larger, is it smaller? We start by perplexing you, and then I help you get unperplexed with my discipline. That's my play now. And then at the end of it, I share with you what the objective of it all was. That's been the difference in my teaching, my transformation with perplexity in a nutshell right there. We know what the opposite looks like. The opposite looks like this right here, a video I found on this company's uh, YouTube site. Check it out right here. Let's talk about why integers are important, and then we're going to get into the steps of solving the equation. Okay. Integers are important for a couple of reasons. Number one, we know that integers are important because it is a state standard. 
a state standard is um, something that every fifth grade student in California needs to know. So we will be tested upon it. That makes it important. Uh, fuzzy audio, perhaps, just to summarize the gist there is that you will be tested on this stuff. That makes it important right there. Now that's like, that's like worst case scenario, but I've done other things in a similar vein, not quite as bad. I try to tell myself not to say stuff like, today kids, we're gonna learn about surface area of rectangular prisms and start this today we're gonna learn about. My goal now, every day, whatever I teach, I start with today we're gonna ask about. That's my goal now. Uh, I, I love uh, uh, Matt Vaudry, Southern California's finest, in our fourth row here. Great guy. I, I love his transformation here. Earlier, he would, uh, he would write down the goal of the day right here, his objective, as we're all told to do. But nowadays, Matt tells me, he writes up uh, his, uh, he calls it his daily doozy, his daily doozy. Doozy is, of course, Matt's own vocabulary. You can choose other words, of course. I encourage you to. It's kind of weird. But I love that it's a question. It's a question, not a statement or objective right there. I aspire to that every day. So this is, this is my transformation here. This right here is my ed tech mission statement. This is how I go to all kinds of different sessions and I don't feel as tense. Like, man, this stuff takes a lot of time, patience, and cash. This helps me know what I'm looking for. I encourage you to ask yourself today, tonight, over drinks, wherever, ask yourself, what is my ed tech mission statement? What am I looking for here at Q? And then go and find it. I mean, this right here, finally, like this, this tension here, I want to report to you that it never goes away for me. And even better, I don't want it to go away. I want to close with this thought here. So that tension will always exist and should always exist. We want it to exist. That knot right there, the fact that we have only 180 hours of our kids' time mean the decisions that we make with that time matter. That is the great, that knot right there is the great privilege of the job of teaching. So I encourage you guys, go out armed with your ed tech mission statement and an appreciation of that knot right there, that tension, and enjoy the infinite here at Q. Thanks, guys. Have a great conference. It's been a treat. Thank you. Thank you.